<laughs> because I have, oh, thank you. Lovely, lovely, and thank you, Alice. Um, <laughs> this month, the theme is Mind Matters, and it is inspired by the, the article in the Science Mind magazine, of which we are sold out, happily, and the newest book, You Are the Placebo, Making Your Mind Matter, by Dr. Joe Dispenza. I will be referring to that a lot today in the talk, and given what we all know and heard and certainly going on, we're going to start in a different angle. And the title for today's talk is Up the Down Staircase. And there was a book or a film in the late 60s by that title, and I think I wasn't, it wasn't one of those mature movies, you know, thoughtful and all of that, so I don't even think I was allowed to see it or don't know it, but the title came to me last night because as I was wending my way through the Dispenza placebo mind information, there is no way to get beyond the specter of what took place for me and many, I know, with the passing of Robin Williams. And I thought about how that it took me down the staircase. And I know whether or not you knew him or were a fan, et cetera, I can tell you that I have had many conversations with friends and some clients. You, all you need to do is look at Facebook posts, and you realize what a significant impact this transition has made on people, and for various reasons. And so one of the key things that I want to start out by saying today is, if anyone here, or on YouTube, if anyone is feeling uh, despondent or grief or sadness about this, and you wonder why, you think, I never knew the man, and you know, I have no connection to him, but you're having your own experience of grief, please do not judge that. Please allow yourself that process because grief is a unique animal <laughs> and it will bite you in different ways and how we heal through our grief is very individual. And although you may never have ever watched anything Mr. Williams ever did, something about the consciousness that took place with his transition may have tapped something within you. So if you have felt a discomfort, a sadness, flat-out grief, please be kind to yourself. Let us be kind with to support you because I can tell you, I heard the news. I, I didn't know the man. His work, as, as John said, was extremely impactful to me in a lot of ways. I often, um, on a Sunday, have said that I thought I was Robin Williams' illegitimate sister that he never met <laughs> because of my relation to him and about how his mind would work and how quickly he did things and that, that humor and that, that passion that he had that so many people didn't understand. And so his loss really knocked me for a loop. And so I had to look at that as I processed that. And I know that there, his transition is opening up a new awareness for many people about... <sighs> the struggles that we have, the demons that we have. I have on my Facebook page a, a placard that says, um, be kind because everyone you meet is fighting a battle that you know nothing about. And that what you may see on the outside for any of us may look just fine, healthy and happy and beautiful and connected, etc. And we do not know if someone is having challenges inside their head. It could be as simple a challenge as they're dyslectic and they don't know how to communicate that and they grew up in trying in schools and they're still embarrassed and they don't want to talk about it. So there's a little bit of a demon or a battle. Or it could be something as severe as, um, you know, manic depression or another ailment or an illness. We do not know. And anyone who has had some sort of uniqueness within themselves and you, you want to fit in so you have it hidden or you learn how to be very well functioning in society so that if you were in a crowd, someone would look at you and go, hmm, nothing wrong, because there's no obvious signs. So his passing may have brought a new awareness and a new tenderness that many of us need to remember that we can't just judge a book or a person by their cover. And that we need to meet people where they are at with an open mind and an open heart of compassion so that we are there to be of support. So I just say all that because, wow, 
if you have felt any things and you, you try and suppress it because you go, why am I feeling out of sorts about this? It could be because it's tapping into something within you that needs to be brought forth, or maybe only within yourself, to be understood, to be blessed, to be healed. And if that does happen, or today's talk triggers something in you, that's why we have the corner over there where the practitioners meet with you, where you can get a spiritual mind treatment to shift that so that you can go up the down staircase. Because I, I can guarantee that there isn't one of us in here who hasn't felt themselves. You know how when, they, when kids used to get on staircases and they'd slide down the banister? Well, that part was fun, wasn't it? But when you're sliding down the slippery slopes of the rabbit hole of emotional stuff that happens in our lives, because it does in our human lives, you know that you have skills and tools and a community by which if you are going down that staircase, that we have ways to assist you back up and that that's what we're here for. I really have been contemplating all week, why do people come to a center like this? We could, you know, as I'm listening to my Deepak and you know, meditation and doing all that, I'm going, I, get I do that here, I can meditate. Why do we come here? It's exactly for that, for that connection, for that community, for that uh, support. You know, when you feel like you need something or you're going down the rabbit hole and you want someone to toss you a line so that you can make your way back up. That's what we do. We support, teach, and, and embrace you to go back up the down staircase. So I needed to say that because I, I, I'll just speak for myself. It's been a tough week. In addition to that grief and loss, some of you already know, I'll just say it so we can get it clear. I guess I'm just such a sweet little thing that every single bug on this planet likes to have me as a snack. However, I happen to be allergic to that. <laughs> so this week, somewhere around here, somehow, I became lunch and I began to have an issue with that, an allergic reaction. Um, and Don had to come home and take me over to urgent care and through the wonders of modern science, that's why I said it's really good to be here today because sometimes you, you look at, you have someone have a transition, a real transition, and then you're faced with something where you're in the middle of the night and you're scared and things aren't working right and things are like, whoa, and you go, whoa. So to be here is really a good thing. It's a really good thing. And I thought about, Don shared with me that on his way home to pick me up to take me over to urgent care, he was listening to an NPR you know, story. And it was about some new medical condition where they're looking into the concept of chronic itch. And of course, I'm like, mm, <laughs> you know, itch. And, and what, and I think there's a technical name for it, I don't remember it, but there's something about, you know, when we have an itch, a bite or something, the thing that we want to do immediately is scratch it. And for that microsecond, as we scratch, it feels good, and then when the, even before you take your hand off, it hurts again. So th I was thinking about that dichotomy of what it's like, of the yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, and that the simple, crazy, you know, um, bug sandwich that I was going through that, I related it to that's sometimes what it's like in the world when we are dealing with something that outside people call depression. And depression's become a word that's used way too casually, you know? It's, it's like we say Xerox when we want to photocopy, and we just expect that. And people really do have issues with depression, but if we've, we've all gone through that where we've had downcast days, or we're gloomy, or our heart's broken, and we didn't get a job, and people say, what's wrong? And you say, well, I'm depressed. And, and we're not really clinically depressed, and we have people who are, but th what I thought about was, because all of us have gotten used to saying that, what's wrong, oh, I'm depressed, and you fill in the blank, we've added that into race consciousness. We've created an environment of possibility of what we know as depression, and as you know I will do with words, I thought, what is depression? Depression is that squishing down, pressing down spirit. It is when we are feeling downcast that we don't remember the greater idea of who we are that we feel depressed, depressed in our, our livelihood, our work. We're depressed in our bodies sometimes. We are depressed. And we need to find, need, we don't need anything but air and water because we got everything else. We have it all. We have it all. 
what we might want to do is to allow the, the people, places, and things that are in the universe around us to support us to go back up the down staircase to finding a place, a remedy, by which whatever version of depression is taking place for oneself, that you can go back up. And that's what we teach. And in case you thought I was just going to do a whole emotional, psychological thing in grief, I'll bring us back to Dr. Joe. Because the whole idea, you are the placebo, is really what he's talking about. Now, y'all, most of you know what a placebo is. Latin word for sugar pill, and what many, many research and scientific studies have done, they've taken a person with an emotional or a physical ailment, and they've given them pills. Well, some of those pills had medicine to treat the ailment. Some of those pills were sugar pills. But the point being that the patient thought the magic was in the medicine. And when the doctor gave him the pills, it allowed for the healing to take place. So science has been studying this for years. This isn't something new that Dr. Dispenza has found. They've been studying for years that something about the emotional shift in one's head that this pill is going to cure what ails you, you go, OK, and you take it. And amazingly enough, you start to feel better. They've proven that most studies work that way. Of course, there are cases when that doesn't happen. But what, is, what do we know as science of mind people about that? We've set an intention. We have said that this is the pill that will make the difference. We know it in a different way. That's medical treatment. We use spiritual mind treatment. But you are the placebo, and what he's saying in this amazingly bo amazing book. I, I, can't, I can't even get through. I mean, the article in the magazine is like, um, 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 oh, it's so amazing. He simplifies it. He makes it easy to understand that you are the placebo, meaning you have the ability to change your thinking. Where did he get that? Change your thinking to change your life, to change your body, to change what's going on here. So that if you find yourself in fear of an ailment, a relationship loss, etc., etc., you have the ability to shift that, to become your own sugar pill, to take what you need to internally to transform. And he, and he talks about ways to do that. I was thinking more about how the, when, one, when any or all of us slide down the rabbit hole, I thought, wow, Lewis Carroll really had an insight, didn't he? I mean, he managed to create this fictional story of Alice in, in Wonderland and, and the metaphor of sliding down the rabbit hole and the slippery slopes. And sometimes when we're in our stuff, we start to slide down the rabbit hole and then, it, 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 then we can grapple our way back up quickly. Sometimes we have to, hello up there, please send me you know, a ladder or something to get that. And then the image that I had is that when you use these spiritual mind treatments and you use what... Dr. Dispenza is talking about. How many of you have seen the movie Christmas Story? Do you remember the scene when, they, when Ralphie goes to see Santa Claus? I, lo I love the movie immensely anyway. But Ralphie goes to see Santa Claus, sits on Santa Claus's lap, and he, he gets scared. You know, kids, it's like they, they see a clown or they see Santa Claus, and then they get scared. And he couldn't remember what it was he wanted to ask for for Christmas. So Santa says, oh, we'll get you a football, and pushes him down the snowy slide to, to see the next kid. And Ralphie's going down the slide going, no, wait, and climbs his way back up to Santa Claus and asks for what he wants, the Red Rider. And I thought, what? there are days when it's like that for us. What I really want to do is think about that, is, is, okay, Ralphie, I can do it, and climb back up and ask for what we want, affirm what we need, be able to use these um, affirmations. You know, we say these affirmations every week, and I wonder if you guys really get why we're doing that. We're doing that, and, I, and we put it on that piece of paper so that you can take it home, so that if one of them really resonates to you, you can use it as an affirmation, repeat it, so that we're changing not only your thinking and thoughts, but the race consciousness, so that we're making the difference. Because what I think, he didn't say it. Well, maybe he did. I haven't finished the book. I think religious science is the placebo for the world, and nobody knows it yet. We are sneaking it in to certain, you know, we're doing it this way. Oh, here, oh, is that, oh, here, try this. I know that you are one with God. Mm, okay. We are the placebo as a movement. And we're not even claiming it. 
I don't understand why, and so I can't, I can't be responsible for the entire movement, so I have to figure out why I'm not totally claiming it. And that's what I looked at this week in juxtaposition of the, the grief and sadness about Mr. Williams passing, in juxtaposition of sitting in the, a medical place, which is, if you know me, it's like, I don't doctor's medicine, oh, allopathic medicine. It's like, no, give me something organic and holistic, please. And then the, then the religious scientist in my head is going, really, Duchess? Is, doctors, uh, is, is, doctor, um, is there not God in the doctor? Yes. Is there not God, infinite intelligence, and wisdom within that prescription? Yes. Can you allow yourself to be open and receptive to the fact that you have been led here to do this, to accept this, and allow your healing? Yes, I can. But I had to look at that because I went through, even while I was really uncomfortable, it was like, Bleh, I was going through, why am I sitting here? Why, why, why can't I think away these bug bites and the, and the fever and the whole thing that's going on? Well, any of us who have been in a challenge, a health challenge, an emotional challenge, you know, even a, a silly grand summer head cold, to try and think about, oh, I've only got, uh, you know, you're clogged. It isn't as easy, is it? Truly. And I thought, okay, well, I may not be a saint. I'm not quite that elevated, so I'm sitting here, and okay, doctor, I will accept this concurrently with my spiritual mind commitment. I have, I want to let you know that I sent the prayer request to the practitioners before Don picked me up and took me <laughs> to get medical treatment because I know and I believe in that, which is why as I was sitting there and the doctor was saying, well, okay, now we're going to do this prescription, the little voice was saying, can you be okay with that? Can you take this prescription? Will you? And it was, I've already set into motion that I want to be led to what is my highest and best to serve my body, to heal, and to express. So, yes, I did. He goes on to say, well, Dispenza, in case you didn't know, he combines the fields of quantum physics, neuroscience, brain chemistry, biology, genetics. He talks about a new, well, that's not even new. It really came back from the 60s as well. Epigenetics, there's a new word for you toss it out and you know when you go to brunch later today you know well I was talking about the epigenetics of things you, you, you know you look really really lofty so we we see this stuff around us and we have an opportunity to use spiritual mind treatment to use the placebo that we are to transform things he says that oh I know wait let me go hmm. As part of his search to turn to scientific observations as healing tools that people can use, Dispenza looked at the research for the scientifically well-studied placebo effect in which people are given the inert substance like a sugar pill and believing that the drug will cure them and therefore they heal. Because of thoughts alone, Dispenza says their bodies produce healing hormones and chemicals. Because of their thoughts alone, before the pill ever enters their mouth, Healing takes place, the hormones kick in, chemicals within the body temple, real chemicals, not just pleasant, happy thoughts. Chemicals change in the body. This is scientific. This is the religious science part of what our philosophy is. We back it up. It's not just airy-fairy philosophy. He then reasoned that a strong belief in the healing powers of a harmless external substance can produce a healing. Then why can't people experience healing by a strong belief in their own consciousness and their own body to heal? Well, they can. Yes. Hence, you are the placebo. He goes through. There's all kinds of studies. So those of you who need, you know, the, the white coat, uh, uh, concrete study. He's got studies. He's got other doctors that work with him. They do all the biofeedback tests. They do all of this to substantiate what we have been talking about and even what, you know, Eastern philosophy has been talking about for eons, that you are what you think, that you are the outpicturing and expression of your higher thoughts or your predominant thoughts. So we need to sometimes change our thoughts. That's why I said if Robin Williams' transition stirred up stuff in you, and you went, oh, no, 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 well, it's got nothing to do with me. There may be something within that that you need to look at. Because when pain comes up for us, whether it be emotional pain, grief, 
loss, sadness, or physical pain. You know, you've got this or you've got bug bites that are swelling you up, you know, like I felt like the, the Michelin tire person. You've got those things. You need to look at why is that pain there in your life? What is the pain? What is the message trying to tell you? And sometimes, particularly with emotional pain, we suppress it. We depress it so we don't have to deal with it. Or we think we're not skilled to deal with it. Or we're afraid to deal with it. So what happens? The pain waits around and goes, well, let's see, okay, didn't, she didn't pay attention when we had the, you know, the pain in her neck. Well, we'll try her back. Maybe that'll work. Hmm, that didn't work. Okay, let's see what else we can do. Oh, man. So now she's got this ailment. This is hoping the body works so beautifully to try and translate what needs your attention. It outpictures in different pains, emotional or physical or both, to get your attention, to look at it, to heal it, to bless it, to love it, release it, or to understand whatever was the genesis of that thought belief in the first place. So we need to release that. And the interesting thing is that hmm, a lot of times our pain, and it doesn't, I'm not talking right now about the big pain, the real serious stuff that comes in our life, because it does. I'm not judging that. The first thing we must release is any judgment on one another, for one another or ourselves, about when there is a pain, when there is an issue. But we have to look at that, that sometimes that becomes part of our story. Whatever the ailments may be. It becomes part of our story. And it becomes part of the story that we create to keep people out or away. Or a story so that we don't do the inner work. That we don't do the meditation, the journaling, the classes, the internal process by which to understand and reveal what it is that's causing the pain in the first place. And so... What happens? We kind of get addicted to our stories. And then I started looking at that because certainly a lot of the news press were talking about, you know, Mr. Williams and addictions and drug abuse and alcohol and blah, 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 and addictions, addictions, and trying to blame it all on that. And I thought, don't cast the first stone, social media. Who among us doesn't have an addiction? It may not be an addiction to alcohol or drugs or gambling or the big things that society has claimed to be um, detrimental to your well-being. But we have addictions to our stories, to some of our... My, my grandmother used to call them her programs, her TV programs, the television shows that she... Oh, i got to watch my program. You know, I can't miss it. <laughs> that was before, you know, DVR and, and stuff. We have addictions to uh, things that do bring us comfort. Habits. Habits are addictions. But we don't call, if it's something that brings us comfort and that we enjoy, we don't call it an addiction. We call it a habit or a ritual. Or we have an addiction, say, to um, a coffee beverage served at a certain place that becomes part of your almost every Sunday talk <laughs> because it is an addiction for me. It's not a chemical addiction. I'm, I'm going on record because this does go out to YouTube. Uh, it's not a chemical addiction. I have gone without going to that green beverage place. Uh, I've gone without the beverage itself. It's not about that. But for me, Starbucks is part of my story, my identity. I love it. But it's part of my addiction and my story. Now, that's an addiction that I look at and I go, oh, okay, it's a story, it's okay, it's going to be fine. But there are things in my life that I would call addictions that I don't think are serving me. And again, it's nothing big and dramatic. Don't worry, your minister's, you know, like whole, perfect and complete, uh, ethical, legal, all is well, you know. But the addictions that we have, I have an addiction to certain television shows too. You know, it's like, I have to have it. Did you record it? Oh my God, oh! You know, especially, and then you watch two in a row. It's like a binge addiction. Oh, ho, ho. four hours worth of Downton Abbey. All right, you know. <laughs> so again, you all would laugh at that and you don't think that's an addiction. But it is in some ways. And what I'm trying to say about that in a gentle, loving, laughable way is that if we have those kinds of addictions, what, who's to say that we don't have others? Or why are we judging when someone else has an addiction? Instead of going to a compassionate place of knowing that there is a way up the down staircase. And Mr. Dispenza gets really bold and talks about addictions. And I thought that was really cool because uh, he talks about the chemistry of negative emotions. Uh, let me find that one about addiction because it's, yeah, it's like I could read the whole book to you. <laughs> I'm 
change is very difficult for a lot of people because if they don't overcome that negative emotion, then they can walk right back into their life and see a person or a place that triggers those negative, those negative emotions. And much like Pavlov's dogs, they autonomically, physiologically, and psychologically return back to the old chemical state of being without conscious mind even being involved. Now let me translate that for you. So you're working on stuff and you're doing your affirmations and then you go somewhere and a person or an event triggers an unhealed emotion. Tran this transition this week. There was stuff to heal. So what does that do? It can start, doesn't have to, but it can start the flood of thoughts, the monkey mind chatter that starts doing and saying the things from your old default mechanism consciousness that brings you back to the space where you suddenly go, I'm depressed, I'm downcast. And then other things start to outpicture because chemically we're wired that way. It's as if, oh, oh, I know what it is. He didn't say that. Okay, okay, okay. Hold, let me see how to translate that. All right, those of you who have computers know that oftentimes when you go to send an email, there's a, there's a process called autofill, right? When you send in an address. I even found out this Sunday. I, in my haste, I was trying to send the new town crier to John Burge. And in my haste, I typed John, did not pay attention, and it went to John Boyle because it autofilled the last person that I had emailed. It autofilled it for me. I was not conscious and mindful enough to look and go, oh, wrong John, change. Do, 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 do. So when a negative thought or a situation happens out here, that you already have an autofill for it, which means we must be mindful so that if a negative thought, a situation, something triggers you, that you, you have the reaction, and then you look at it and you go, oh, wait, that's old stuff. That's not current. I'm not choosing to be that. You take your sugar pill and you shift it. Otherwise, your body literally is wired to respond in the old pattern. That's what he was talking about in reverse when he said hormones and chemicals will change with your thinking, with meditation. I mean, he has got documentation about how the actual process of meditation shifts the body so much. We've heard that for decades. Back, transcendental meditation. You know, it's not just currently. That it really, really does change the chemistry of your body. And if the chemistry changes, then you're not going to project the negative externals or the addictions. He goes on to say, they are looking for conditions in their life that bring up feelings, that reinforce existing beliefs about who they are as a person. These emotions, these negative emotions and triggers. You can turn on the stress response with thought alone. Oh my God, just by sitting here, if you start thinking about something that stresses you out, you are stressing the physicality of your being, let alone the mental stuff. You think you're just thinking about that. My grandmother also used to call that worrying. You think that that's, oh, it doesn't mean anything, but you start thinking about some, a stress thought. You start worrying and the body goes, you know, alarms go off in the body. Okay, produce that cortisol, produce that chemical. Let's get ready, fight or flight. You can turn on the stress response with thought alone by thinking about your problems, and the chemicals that happen when you do that are addictive in your body. People then become addicted to their own thoughts, but they don't know that. <sighs> so what I'm trying to say to you, I'm trying to give you guys a big like amnesty washover and hug, that you may have been beating yourself up about having uh, repetitive negative thoughts, and you keep trying to change, and you think, why can't I do that? Understand for a while that some of that is the chemical response. And it's your body's response to that. It's not your fault, air quotes. However, then you must get clear, be mindful, pay attention, and go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. My mind and body are going through this, stressing out. I'm getting to that. I need to shift that. How do I shift that? Once you change for the better and the circuits are firing and wiring differently in the brain, you are no longer producing the same chemicals that were signaling your body emotionally. Then what happens, just like an addict, you go through a withdrawal. 
Have we also had that? Where you start, you come to, on a Sunday and you go, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I say my affirmations and you're doing good. And then something triggers on the external world or you start thinking and then you start going down the slippery slopes again. And you're on withdrawal and you go, oh, what did I do wrong? I thought I was doing so well. So what happens like an addict, you go through withdrawal. The cravings of the body are looking for an emotional rush. Oh, my God. We judge, I, I won't, sorry, I have judged external addicts seeking that high, the emotional rush from chemicals, etc. external chemicals. When I had to own this week, thank you, Mr. Williams, I had to own this week that a lot of my history and my emotional negative stuff I was addicted to because it did give me an emotional rush. It did give me a something. Now, when I detach myself from that and I look at that, it's not something I'm fond of, proud of, or want. But it was in my wiring. My body was used to doing that. And it, it is incumbent upon me, my choice, but being a religious scientist, to then shift that. First of all, open up a sense of giant compassion and go, oh, I get it. It isn't anything that I have done wrong. It isn't anything that I didn't, you know, I was a good little Catholic girl. You've got to do your homework. You've got to brush your teeth. You've got to make your bed. All those things. And if you didn't do those things, there was literally hell to pay. <laughs> it's not like that. But something in me kept thinking that. And what would happen if we do that? Well, oftentimes, a lot of the pain or the stories that I had, I would depress them because I didn't want to look at them. I certainly didn't want anybody out here to see them. So I would choo -choo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> Everything's fine. Yeah. <sighs> because that was the chemical response. That was my addiction to the emotions. <sighs> we want to be healthy and happy and heal our body. And sometimes the distractions, external distractions, show up, you know, our bodies are like Hal the computer in 2001. It learns something and you heal it and you fix it and it goes, well, maybe if I mutate it just slightly, how about now? Can you still love it? Can you still heal it? Yes, yes. But we've taken physical pain, sometimes we transmute it to emotional pain or the emotional pain goes to physical pain and then we start healing that and we're pretty good at that. So what do we do? We create other stuff outside that looks like distractions, issues that take us away from everything that we talk about, the, the crux of who we are, which is to be here now, to be mindful, to be present, to know our wholeness to know everything that John quoted from Ernest Holmes in the meditation this morning about the light of heaven that we are, that guides us on our path, which boils down to me of we are enough. I am enough. Each of us is enough as we are, who we are, right here. Wow. They're enough. Those kids know it. And we're working here at the center to grow the youth ministry so that they really know it and that <laughs> they grow up in that race consciousness instead of the one that suppresses, depresses, slippery slopes, etc., etc. Not that life isn't going to happen and they have growth, etc. I get that. But I would have loved to have grown up in a philosophy, a community where it was okay to be me to be weird, to be creative, to be quiet, to be shy, to be any or all of these things that each of us are that have not been safe or accepted out there. And Mr. Williams was a perfect example of that. And many of us kept thinking, well, if, if someone who is rich and famous like that can have such angst and struggle, holy, uh, well, what's going to happen to me? <sighs> we changed that. We can change that. I can't make you change that. I am not giving you sugar pills. I am giving you real stuff that will change the way you live 
your life the way you feel. And it really boils back down to meditation, prayer, mindfulness, and wholeness. Right where you are, right as you are. Each time we pray and or meditate, we train, this I wrote, oh, this is my quote, not his, ha, <laughs> each time we pray or meditate, we change the structure of the rabbit hole. Oh, yes, I was telling this to a client last, last night, working with a client who was grappling with his own issues based on, triggered by Mr. Williams' passing. We talked about the rabbit hole. And what I said to him was that every time we do a prayer, every time we shift a thought, every time we are the placebo, we change the structure of the rabbit hole so that it begins to fill in. If you think of a hole, it begins to fill in. And it maybe even gets to the place where your spiritual practice is starting to get so strong that beautiful grass grows over it. And it's no longer a landmine. It's no longer a place where you're going to trip and go sliding down. You may, the, the ground may be soft sometimes. Or you, if it starts to crumble, you go, oh, <laughs> I must not be thinking clearly. And you don't fall down the rabbit hole. So every time, and this he does substantiate, every time you do your spiritual practice, every time you think a different thought, every time you become mindful, take those affirmations home, every time you do a meditation, you are literally changing the wiring of your system, you are changing the chemicals in your body, and you're giving yourself the package by which you can live healthy, whole, and perfect, and complete. So each time we dismantle old beliefs, thoughts, and feelings, we eliminate the risk of falling down the rabbit hole because it no longer exists. Those are my words, because I know that. And then today, listening to the, the new series of Deepak and Oprah, the 21-day series. I, I'm one day behind, and I'm, today I chose to listen to the one on hope. And you know what? Hope gets a really bad press in religious science. Because, yeah, because people go, hope, oh, I hope. And as if it doesn't, that it, it's instead of, no, no, we don't hope, we know, we affirm. Yes, we do. We affirm and we know. And hope. So, so I, I noticed that I sort of kept hope maybe on second level. It's like, because you don't want to say, oh, I, I stopped writing to people. I hope you had a good day because I didn't want them to think that religious science minister didn't know that all is well. <laughs> so I'd stop saying, I hope you had a good day. No. So uh, Oprah quoted someone, and she started off by saying, I love this. Truest self doesn't wait for hope or even hope for hope. Essential self emanates hope rooted in all perf powerful certainty of source. Oh, yes. Essential self emanates hope. So I've started to capitalize it for me so that I can shift my thinking about it. That hope isn't some, like, uh, like you know, like King's X cross. I hope, maybe, would you, could you, please? No. Hope. Wah! Hope is a thing with feathers that flies beautifully. And I'm giving it its, its due respect again. Truest self doesn't want for hope or even hope for hope because it is part of the essential nature rooted in the all-powerful certainty of source. Then she quoted her, she said her friend, ooh, Nobel laureate winner Eli Wiesel, I may not be pronouncing his name correctly, amazing man. He wrote, just as a man cannot live without dreams, he cannot live without hope. If dreams reflect the past, Hope summons the future. I went, okay. So on those days where we don't feel particularly good for whatever reason, real, imagined, story, addiction, bug bites, stuff, we can be in the now and hope for that greater future because I am knowing and affirming the difference. I am affirming and knowing that I am the placebo by which my own body chemistry is going to heal me inside and out, emotionally and physically, and hope that tomorrow reflects the essence and the nature of my divinity of which she speaks. We have two more Sundays in this month, and I'm going to talk more about Mr. Dispenza and some of the practicality of what you can do but it really all, I'll give you, the, you know, I'll give you the, the short version now. It really all boils down, back down to what you already know. You need to do the inner work. 
You need to be still enough, quiet enough to listen to some of the loud cacophony screaming or the little nee 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 in the committee voice and deal with it. Love it. If you are, oh, those of you who have come into my office for counseling or meetings and stuff, you may have not, not noticed that on the back of that door, the private door, I have a, a sign that I bought, a beautiful art sign, and it says, take what you need. And there are little pieces of paper. On one it says love, one says courage, one says hope, one says faith, etc. And I think three people have availed themselves of that since I installed it. I'm saying you have everything you could need right here, right now. And that whatever your story, your addiction, your stuff, your pain, that you are the placebo to healing that, that you already have all the tools, you have everything that you could ever need, want, or desire to transform your life. So maybe instead of praying for the outside thing, person, place, or thing, Maybe what we need to do, mm, mm, 21 days for practice, mm, mm, maybe what we need to do, mm, maybe the community needs to, to know for the community that we have the willingness and the courage to do it. That we have the focus and the passion to want to do it. Because it's all here. You know, where it's kind of like giant... Costco here, you can come here, you can get anything you want, large size, you can get it, really good deal, you can do all that, but you, sometimes you kind of go into Costco and you just look around, oh, that's nice, that's nice, and you leave. I don't want to be that Costco for us. I want to be the place, like the sign on the back of my door, that you take what you need, what will serve you, what will be your placebo, your sugar pill for the day, to allow you to do that work. So I'm going to take us in right now, and I'm, that's what I'm going to pray for. So please close your eyes for a moment. Get still. I know I've oh, bounced you around. Wow. Take a breath. Oh, that sweet breath. Oh, that perfect, amazing oxygen inspiration that does wonders. It oxygenates the body cells, but most importantly, it brings you into present time. This moment, right here, right now, the one that they talk about in all of the poetry and all of the highfalutin spiritual teachings, the power of now. Claim it. Most of us are so busy worrying about the next now and the now that's going to happen in an hour. Be here now. Breathe in and know that it's going to be safe to be here now because whatever your now is inside, you are safe to have it and feel it and experience it within these walls of this community where we're all doing it together. Where we are reminding ourselves that there is only one life and that life is the life of God and that life is my life now. And contained within that life is Everything, the totality of being, all possibility, all potential. Both the potential of upward thinking and expression, as well as the potential for downcast. But today, today, our potential is about going up the down staircase. So if you have been traveling down that staircase, you are now moving back up to solid ground, holy ground whereupon you stand in your magnificence. And if you heard a little voice in your head say, my magnificence, what about this ache, this pain, this lack, this minus, this negative stuff, just blow it away, dispel it. You can look at that another time. Right now, with the power of where two or more are gathered, we are focusing, we are embracing and inviting, looking, allowing, and extolling the magnificence of now. Your now, my now, this now. I am one with God. God is my life now. Therefore, everything that I need to know, understand, 
express and experience is available to me. So today, just for today, I am not going to pray and affirm and spiritually mind treat for any particular person, place, or thing. My prayer today is to know more God. My prayer today is to allow the inner vision of who I am to be what I reflect on the outside so that I see the beauty in everything and everyone that I meet. That is my reflection. Today, my prayer is that I continue to have the focus, the determination, the dedication, the courage to do the inner work that is being called forth. That I have the wherewithal to take and be my own placebo to my wholeness. No qualification, I mean, no, disqual no disclaimers, that's the word I wanted. None of those, you don't have to, no. Right now, can you allow yourself to take a breath in and think that right now it is perfect? Right this second, you, me, we are perfect, whole, and complete. And where there are areas that we need to attend to, it will come up for us. We will be shown. And we also know that we have what we need around us in this community that's in our little spiritual toolkit by which to address any or all of it. My prayer today is to know more of my divine nature, my divine wholeness, to know myself as God knows me, that the same way that God created me in the first place, to be my own genesis awareness. That's the prayer, simple, sweet. And so now I just take it and I release it. I'm not attaching anything else to it because I know it's already so. I know it's already done because it was really already there in the first place. And now I get to step forward from this point on to feel it, to notice it, to see it, to watch it, to play with it, to be it, to share it. This is it. Right here, right now. Simple, sweet. I give it back over to God, I let it be, and together we say, and so it is, and so I am, and so we are. <laughs>